Our move from Salt Lake City to Dallas is finally starting to feel settled. The garage is starting to look like a real shop now, so I can start again on the airplane. Let me give you a tour of the shop, and also I want to go over to the installation of the autopilot servos. The garage is smaller than my previous one, but I think I can make it work. The first step was dealing with the 40 years of schmutz embedded in the floor. So I had it professionally coated where they first diamond grinded the surface, then applied primer and two coats of epoxy paint. There were still some ruts that weren't filled and it's already lifted in a couple spots, but it's so much better than that ugly floor with all the oil stains. Then it's onto the walls. I removed the haphazard shelves in the cubby, patched all the holes and cleaned up all the damaged drywall before painting. The color is special though, and something I've always wanted to do. When I was a kid, I promised myself that someday I would have a big shop and paint the walls the same color as the consoles in Mission Control during the Apollo era. Maybe as a tribute to my dad's work during the Apollo moonshots. Although, I went with a little lighter shade of the blue-green color to help brighten up the shop from the available light. The cubby at the back is kind of awkward, because it's an odd size and it's raised a few inches from the rest of the garage but the width actually fit my big tool chest and workbench perfectly. Although, the step up is a little awkward and someday I'm gonna trip over it. I added high shelves along the sidewall for easy accessible storage of mostly supplies, but also a few components. Then also along the sidewall are the clamps and layout tools while always leaving room for additional tools. The shelves in the cubby are mostly for manuals, small parts bins, and power tools. The garage is just a little too small to mount the big side benches, carousel, and charging station for my old garage, so I'll keep those in storage with the wings and engine. The drill press, grinder, and sander will be stored in the backyard shed for the time being. Awkward, but retrievable. I'll definitely miss all the bench space and convenience in this smaller shop. I also added a couple of overhead lighting units, because as you know, garages are notoriously lacking good lighting. And finally, I added insulation to the garage door, as these really helped my last garage stay relatively comfortable both in the winter and summer. But with a brief winter snap in Dallas, I discovered the top of the big garage door leaked air really bad, so I installed a weather strip on top which greatly reduced any drafts. So I think it turned out pretty well, and even though the shop is a little cramped with everything tucked over to one side so I could still fit in the car, it'll do, and I really like the colors. So once the garage shop was completed, it was time to pull the cocoon fuse lodge out of storage and finally get moving again after a six month hiatus. This was the moment of truth, whether my efforts to protect the fuse lodge during shipping and storage was successful. And it was. During the inspection, I didn't detect any abrasions or dents that needed repair. <sighs> Boy, that was stressing me out. Before I start covering the fuse lodge, I need to fabricate one last thing on the floor, the autopilot servo mounts. The pitch and roll autopilot servos will both be mounted under the co-pilot seat, as RANS has allocated. I didn't purchase the RANS mounting plates because these are easy to fabricate and customizable to my needs, such as wire runs. The servo mount plates needed to be very rigid and secure. Here, the pitch servo plate was anchored in one, two, three, four, five, six places and an angle bent into the long span. Likewise, the roll servo mount plate was anchored in one, two, and three places, but with angled edges on one, two, and three sides to add rigidity. The roll servo bracket was mounted towards the rear of the plate so mounting bolts can clear a structural tube, while laterally lining up the center groove of the capstan with the control cable. I also then made sure the electrical harness had plenty of slack to make a nice loop. The pitch servo was mounted in the middle of the plate fore and aft, while laterally lining up the servo bell crank with the riser of the control stick torque tube. Then I also made sure the electrical harness had plenty of slack to make a nice loop. The pitch servo bracket is shown here mounted pretty securely with the rod end bearings mounted just loosely. The exact length of the push pull rod will need to be determined during the rigging procedure once the center travel position of the control stick torque tube is determined. And yes, you sharp-eyed sleuths have probably noticed that I was using plain castellated nuts to mount the servo when lock nuts are called for by the manual. Not to worry, 
as I was just doing this while I was fabricating the mounts and when the servos go in for real, I'll use the proper hardware. Besides, these nylon insert lock nuts or nylocks should technically only be used once then tossed for a new one. The position of the roll servo was a little tricky because it was so far aft that there could be interference with the seat. So I test fit the seat in various positions, making sure it cleared both the servo bracket and bridle cable clamp. And it's a good thing I made the interference checks because I discovered that the pole ring of the seat mount quick pin interfered with the roll cable and more critically with the bridle cable clamp. And this is from the factory. So when this bounces around in flight, the cable may become fouled, compromising safety and possibly resulting in a control cable failure. So to fix this, I remove the ring, tap the hole and insert it to screw. This should keep anything from rubbing against the control cable or entangling the bridle cable clamp. I also fabricated another one of these for the pilot side as there are similar interference issues. I lose the ability to pull the pin with just a finger, but I don't expect to be changing the pin munch during normal operations. This may be a temporary fix. We'll see how it goes. With both of these servo mount plates and brackets, I always kept in mind how I would remove these for any repairs after the skin is in place. For instance, making sure I can always get a wrench on a nut or bolt head between the mounting plate and fabric skin. Next was determining the length of the bridle cable and position of the ferrules for the roll servo. At this point, it's important to follow Garmin's install manual precisely. I used a piece of electrical wire to substitute for the bridle cable as I figured out the exact length. It was important that the location of this aft cable clamp be positioned in the center of this bay to provide plenty of throw while not coming in contact with either the pulley or capstan. Likewise, the forward bridle cable clamp needs to have sufficient throw while not interfering with the structure. Then a simple drawing to aircraft spruce resulted in a bridle cable perfectly customized for the installation. Always keeping in mind that, in an airplane, everything vibrates, so adequate clearance must be maintained. Oh, and the bridle cable clamps need to be really tight, as in the field I've seen these loosen up and cause all kinds of havoc. I then derigged the bridle cable completely, as I want to get through all the initial flight testing before working with autopilot rigging just as a safety precaution. The next big task is covering the fuselage with fabric. It'll be a little tedious, but a lot of fun along the way. And actually that's the reason I bought the S20 over the newer S21, because I enjoy the challenge of the fabric work. 